Let's talk a little bit about canning. I have a list of questions that were sent to me on Instagram about all different aspects of canning. So I thought I would answer them on here. That way it can all be condensed kind of into one video to quickly refer people to. This isn't gonna be like an introductory to canning video. I actually am putting one of those together. It'll be out a little bit later this month. These are just some random hodgepodge questions. I also thought it would be fun to, at the end of this video, give you a little glimpse of what our root cellar looks like at this point in the season. We are just finishing up doing a major kind of reorganizing and inventory down there so that we know what we need as we go really into the deep preservation portion of the year. So make sure to stick around to see that tour after I get through these questions. All right, so number one, how to prevent siphoning. So if you aren't familiar, siphoning is when after you have sealed your jars, water comes out of the seal, leaving some of the food that you've preserved inside exposed. It's more common with some foods than it is with others. For example, I often get a lot of siphoning with my peaches, which is extra annoying because they're really, really sticky. But the biggest way that I have learned to prevent siphoning is to allow the jars to cool down in the canner for a period of time before removing them. Especially if you are pressure canning something, letting not only that canner come down in pressure, but even continuing to let it sit there once it's at zero, then removing the jars onto your counter once you have let them cool for a little bit is going to eliminate your siphoning a lot more. Number two, how to keep your jars hot before filling. So I will raw pack a lot of things, meaning that I'm loading them into jars cool so the jars don't necessarily have to be warm. But if you are loading something that is already hot like broth or applesauce and you don't want to have that major temperature change and and have a shock that the jars are gonna crack. The simplest method that I have found for keeping your jars warm is to just put them in the sink, fill them with hot water, and let them sit there. And when it's time to fill them, I will just dump the jar out and then I will load it with whatever I'm actually canning. Some people will put the jars in their oven at like 200 degrees. Some people will boil their jars first and then take them out of the boiling water. I just prefer to fill them with hot water in the sink because then I'm not having the extra heat of an oven going or having to kind of deal with pulling them out of a pot of boiling water. How to know to pressure can versus water bath. So I will go over this more in my video that I mentioned is coming later this month, but the general rule is that it is a low acid food. It needs to be pressure canned. If it is a high acid food, it can be water bath. So high acid foods for the most part are gonna be your tomato products, your fruits, and anything that is pickled, whether it's cucumbers, onions, garlic, there's a lot of things that you can pickle. But those are the three things that can get water bath safely. Tomato products, fruit, and pickled items that have the vinegar for their acidity. Everything else is pressure canned. Meat, non-pickled vegetables, broth, beans, everything in that category is pressure canned. Why do you take the bands off your jars after you're done canning? So the band is the little bit of the little ring that holds the lid on when you are putting them into the canner. And I remove the band for two different reasons. Number one, I use them for the next batch that I'm canning. If I had a band on every single jar that I was storing, I would need to have hundreds and hundreds of bands. And that's kind of a pain to keep track of. The second reason why I keep the band off when I'm storing is because having the tension of the band tightened on the jar after it's sealed can potentially cause any jar that does unseal to artificially reseal itself because of that pressure. There is temperature fluctuations wherever you're storing your jars. Having the band off means that if something does come unsealed, it's gonna stay unsealed and that's a good thing because then you will know that it is 
not safe to eat because it'll probably start to grow mold or something like that. Whereas if it unsealed for a period of time and then it resealed, you could have had some bacteria build up in there, but not maybe have major mold growth yet and you wouldn't be able to necessarily recognize it. Next question is, what is the best thing to start with for a beginner? So the first thing that I ever canned was applesauce, which I think is a great, easy beginner item. After that, I did strawberry jam and tomato sauce. Those I think are the three easiest things to start with. Do I need a pressure cooker? You do not. In fact, a pressure cooker and a pressure canner are actually two different things. You do not want to use a pressure cooker for canning. However, you can use a pressure canner for cooking, but they're two different things. Can I can on a glass stove? I know that most canner manufacturers will recommend not canning on a glass stove, but I also know people that do, and they're just very careful on how they're moving their canner back and forth when it's loaded. So I don't have any personal experience with that, but I know that it can be done. What are your favorite jelly or jam recipes? So for many years, I used a strawberry jelly recipe from a website called oldworldgardenfarms.com. It is a honey sweetened jelly recipe that does not require pectin. I've also used Pomona's pectin, which is a low sugar pectin over the last few years. And they're a little bit different, but we like both of those just because we can kind of control the sweetener that's included in it. What meals can I make from pantry items? Some of our most frequently made meals from pantry items are beef stew, which is just some cubed beef or venison, a jar of potatoes, a jar of carrots, a jar of broth, those four things, and then add them to a pot, add our spices, and maybe a little bit of cream if we want it to be a thicker stew. We also make a lot of chili, which can just be a jar of any ground meat, corn. Sometimes I'll do a jar of salsa, a couple different types of beans. Chili is a super simple meal to make from canned goods. I have also made like chicken pot pie from canned goods. So if you have canned chicken, canned carrots, and some broth to make your roux and all you really need to add is some diced up onions and maybe celery and put it all together in your crust. Those are probably the main meals that I make from canned food. Other times it's just providing a side for our meal that I'm making. What tools do you need to start canning? So I again will go more in depth with this in my video of, for beginner canners but there's not much that you need. They have these whole canning kits that you can buy, you know, on Amazon or at the store. But for the most part, I would say the only thing that you really need is a jar lifter, a pot, and then obviously your canning jars, your lids, your rims. But I don't really use the little magnet lid holder. I don't really use the spacing tool bubbler. You don't have to invest in a whole bunch of different tools if you're just getting started. How to handle multiple batches without breaking jars. So we talked about how you don't want to have a major temperature shift in your jars because it can shock them and cause them to break. If I'm doing multiple batches at a time and I have a pot of water that is hot that I've just unloaded and I'm going to be reloading it with new jars. Really your only option is to A, heat up the jars that you are gonna do for your second batch before you put them in the boiling water, or B, cool down the water in your canner bath so that way it's not as a major shift. More often than not, I will just cool down my water in my canner bath. Yes, it makes it take longer to run the next batch, but it's really frustrating when you have jars break. So I'm willing to deal with that for the sake of preventing jars breaking. What are the signs of spoilage? Mold <laughs> on the top of your food. Pretty much any jar that I've ever had spoil because I leave the bands off, 
it's super, super obvious. And when you are canning as much as we do, um, there are jars that unseal. I mean, I'll probably have a dozen or so, maybe two dozen each year out of the hundreds and hundreds that I do. So it's annoying, it's frustrating, but we try to kind of rotate through our stash pretty frequently so we can spot it and pull them out. Most of the time though, there's pretty evident mold already growing on the very top of the items in the jar. So we can spot it right away. Is it better to can mixed ingredients for meals or individual ingredients? In my opinion, this is mostly just what's your preference. For me personally, because of the size of our family, it takes so many jars to feed us one meal that it is easier as the processor while I'm canning just to do ingredients individually. So I mentioned making beef stew. If I did all of my beef stew ingredients in one jar, yes, in theory, that is easier. But if I still have to open four jars of it to feed us, then I might as well just can them individually because at the actual time of canning, I'm only processing one thing. I'm only doing all meat or all potatoes or all carrots versus multiple different things. The other negative to canning things together is that you have to process for whatever the longest length of time is for your ingredients. So for example, you don't have to process carrots or potatoes for as long as you have to process meat, but you will do it for as long as you have to process meat, meaning that the carrots and potatoes can potentially be a little bit overcooked. So for those two reasons, I typically just do all my ingredients separate. The only exception is really things like salsa, yeah, I guess that's it, that's salsa. That's like one of the only things where I'm mixing multiple things together before I can them. How to sterilize jars efficiently. I don't have a dishwasher. Welcome to the club. I do not have a dishwasher either. And you actually don't have to sterilize your jars. If you're gonna be processing for more than 10 minutes, it will be sterilized during the canning process. So all you have to do is make sure that you're cleaning them super thoroughly. We wash everything by hand at our house, so cleaning them in hot soapy water, making sure they're rinsed thoroughly is good enough for canning. How to prevent poisoning myself. <laughs> I think the biggest way to deal with that fear of botulism and poisoning from canned foods really just comes through experience. I'm gonna be honest, I am not like a hardcore rule follower when it comes to canning. I put up hundreds and hundreds of jars for our family every single year and never once have we gotten sick from something that I have canned. If you're new, follow the recipes, follow the processing times, keep your space relatively clean. Just use your judgment. When in doubt, throw it out. But I don't think that death or poisoning from canned goods is really that common. I mean, I. I'm pretty surrounded in a bubble of home study type people that do canning and never once have I heard of somebody that has experienced botulism personally. So it's probably not as big of a problem as people think it is. How do you decide what recipe to pick? There are so many options. So again, especially if you are first starting out canning, I definitely recommend following a recipe from an approved source. I love the Ball Blue Book. It's a great beginner's canning book. And a lot of times my recipes are out of that book or they're a slight variation of one out of that book. So when you are first starting, it's good to stick to kind of those tried and true recipes versus just getting one off of some random blog on the internet. Can you can without sugar? I can't have it due to my autoimmune disease. You absolutely can. In fact, I pretty much never use sugar when canning. Any of the jam recipes that I follow are either low sugar or honey sweetened. That's just what my preference is for my family, but I would definitely recommend looking into those. Pomona's pectin, again, is what can give like the best results for if you want a really jam-like texture. Last question. It just seems like it takes so long. Is it actually worth it? 
It depends. For us, absolutely it is. Because we are primarily preserving food that we grow, I want to be able to utilize that produce in the seasons when I cannot grow it. Some things you can freeze, some things you can dehydrate. If you're really fancy, you can have a freeze dryer. But for us, having them be shelf stable, ready to eat meals, is just like the ultimate convenience food. And I'm not saying that we don't ever go and get a pizza or anything like that, but in the winter months when we are busy with kids activities and school and things like that, all of the extra work that we do up front, we're saving on the back end by not having to do all of the prep work and all of the cooking every single day. So it's definitely a trade-off as far as like your effort to get food ultimately on the table. But there's also just a really big security factor of having shelf stable, nourishing food for your family and a large amount of it. Let's take a quick look at what our canned goods storage is looking at in early August of this year, which is 2023. We have a fair amount of jars left actually. Um, some of this was bumper crops that we had last year and we just canned more than enough no, knowing that we may not have as big of a crop last year. And to be honest, some of this stuff is things that kind of need to be recycled out because they're getting to be, they're getting to be several years old. Talk to you guys later.